All right, a little bit of singing this morning to stir your soul. I enjoyed the specials and I enjoyed the congregationals as well. And I'm thankful that I belong to Jesus and that he belongs to me. I'm in him. He's in me. He got in me before I got in him, but I belong to him. And if you don't understand that, then you just need to get saved. And then you'll perfectly understand what I just said. Psalm 139. I guess when Jeremy and Mel sing those songs, probably my three favorite songs that they sing, I like them all. Of course, I'm a little biased. Just because I think they're the best singers in the world doesn't mean that, that uh, I don't like other singing, but... <laughs> I'm always glad to hear them sing. And uh, I've been listening to Jeremy sing for a few years now. As a matter of fact, when he was supposed to go to bed at night, they always want five more minutes. Just let me stay up five more minutes, Dad. Let me stay up five more minutes. Well, I wouldn't let him stay up five more minutes, but he knew how to get that five minutes out of me. He'd go up to the top of the steps and sit on that top step, and he'd sing Abide With Me. And that thing has about five verses to it, you know. <laughs> and he'd get another five minutes out of it, because I wouldn't, as long as he was up there singing, he could have sang, you know, for 15 minutes, and I probably wouldn't have made him go to bed, but he always got an extra five out of me. And uh, then Mel joined him, and uh, it's just been a blessing to listen to him sing. But I'll tell you what, when they sing about drinking that water, whew, there's just something in me that uh, <laughs> I've been to the well. And man, once you get a drink of that water, you're never the same. And it reminds me of that <laughs> every time they sing it. And uh, so you just go and blow your nose, do whatever you want to do. I'll wipe my eyes out here in a minute. I don't usually get real. You know, the older I get, the more emotional I get, Art. Join the crowd. I never see you crying. I cry all the time. I'm like a big baby. I used to be tough as nails, man, but anymore, I stand up there and cry. <laughs> uh, they always told me Marines didn't cry. <laughs> I got no news for you. This one does. <laughs> oh, man. 139, Psalm 139, and you know you heard singing t this morning about the Lord, about God, about Jesus Christ, who is God manifested in the flesh. And David, a uh, great psalmist, he wrote many of the psalms in the New Testament, didn't write all the psalms of the, New, uh, the Old Testament, but he wrote many of the psalms in the Old Testament. And uh, here's one of his psalms, and this psalm's about God. And uh, this psalm tells you some things about the attributes of God. And David was a man who knew God. He knew God very well. And God knew him. And uh, so when David writes these, this psalm, he's magnifying uh, the greatness of God and the attributes of God. And uh, shows you some things that separate God from man. We've got this bunch of lunatics running around today. Uh, and and uh, they believe that uh, we all have this little spark of godliness in us that someday we'll grow to the place where we're actually our, God ourselves. Well, uh, you're not ever going to be a God like this God right here. I mean, uh, this God here is able to create. And uh, no other God's able to do what this God has done. The, the devil is a God. And don't forget that. The devil is a God. He's not the God, but he is a God. He's the God of this world. Right now, he has control of the world. Right now, he has the, uh, uh, the power of the kingdoms of this world. One of these days, those things are going to be taken away from him. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and take those things away from him and then cast him in, to a, 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 put him on a chain and throw him into the pit, and he's going to be in there for a thousand years. But here David talks about God and talks about uh, a God unlike any God that a man can make or a man can concoct in his mind. Uh, some people make a God out of an idol. Some people make a God out of a piece of bread. 
Uh, some people make a God out of uh, uh, just their own uh, uh, opinions and brains and things like that. Uh, but this is a God that's different. It says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou hast known my down sittings and mine uprisings. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Uh, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from, the, uh, from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. I'm going to stop right there, and uh, we'll have a word of prayer, and I probably won't get down through this this morning, but we'll just give you a few things about God this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can call you our Father. We're thankful that we can come to you, the God of the universe, the God of all creation, the God that knows everything. And Father, as we come to you this morning, we just ask that you would um, cleanse us from our sin. Lord, we're just sinners saved by your grace, and we need the blood of Jesus Christ to wash us and cleanse us and to cover our sins. Father, as we approach you and come to you, Lord, we know that uh, you're great and we're, we're nothing. And uh, we know that you can do everything and anything, and we can do absolutely not a thing unless you give us the, the power to do it. I pray now, Lord, as uh, uh, the word of God goes forth, as I try to, to teach a few things here, Lord, I pray that somehow uh, it would lodge in the hearts of these people. Somehow uh, you would open our spiritual eyes and understanding and give us some fresh light and some, uh, just something from your word that will uh, encourage us and help us along the way. And Father, help us to always remember just what kind of God you are and uh, that you're a, a God that knows everything about us. We, we cannot hide anything from you, Lord. And so, uh, Lord, help us not to even try. Help us to just be open and honest before you in all things. Help us when we come to you and pray. And as we come before your throne even now, uh, Lord, may there be no false pretenses. May there be no hypocrisy. May there be nothing that would uh, uh, cause the Holy Spirit of God to be grieved or quenched in our lives. And Father, may your word go forth with power. And we'll thank you for it and give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know, uh, as I've already said, the New Agers believe man can become God-like and then become God. Uh, some people make their own gods, and they have idols. And, uh, of course, the, one of the first things the Lord says in his law, that there, a man's not supposed to have any other gods before him. And, uh, and, and so God is a God unlike any God that you'll ever uh, read about. But there are other gods. Uh, the Bible says there's other gods. And as I've said, the devil is a god. But sometimes God just wants to, you to know what kind of God he is. And David does that in this psalm. And he says, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. If you look at the last, next to the last verse in this chapter, David says, Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. In verse 1, thou hast searched me and known me. And now he's asking God to do it over again. You know, every now and then we just need to go to God and, and say, God, search me. Uh, search my heart. Uh, sometimes we don't know our own hearts. We think that everything's right in our heart, and maybe it's not. 
Bible talks about the counsels of the heart, things that are devised in, in, within the heart that maybe you never even talk about, that maybe no one ever, uh, no one else even knows about, but you know about those things and God knows about those things because they have to do with the heart. And so David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Uh, y- you don't know my heart. You can look at me and and you can make judgment on my character. You can make judgment on my actions. You can make judgment uh, in, in your own mind as to what kind of person you think I am. But there's only one person that really knows who I am and what I'm all about, and that's God. He knows my heart. And He knows your heart too. And so many people try to hide the things of the heart from God. There's no sense in trying to hide those things because God already knows about them. And David says, O uh, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sittings and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. In other words, God knows not only your heart, but think about this. We have a personal God. He's not some God way out there someplace in the third heaven, way out there in a couple billion universes away that doesn't know anything about what's going on down here. God looks down on this congregation this morning. He knows everything about you. He knows what's in your heart. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows when the sparrow falls from the ground, but he knows when you get up and when you sit down. He knows your thoughts, the Bible says. Thou knowest my down sittings and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Before that thought ever comes to your mind, God knows about that thought. Now, what, I mean, where are you going to find a, a, a God like that? We use all kinds of fancy terms in theology to describe the attributes of God, like omniscient and uh, omnipresent and uh, ob. omnipotent, and things like that, little big words. And I always scratched my head and I thought, you know, those big words, a bunch of theologians sat around and figured them out. But, but I get down here with David in the Psalms and I, I say this, God knows all about me. And he knows all about me because he's everywhere. And he knows when I sit down, when I get up. That's, that's omnipotent. He, he's just, he just knows everything that there is to know about you and I. But isn't it funny how we try to hide from God sometimes? That's what happened to Adam and Eve when they they sinned. They tried to hide from God. You can't hide from God. You can't hide anything from God. He says there in verse uh, 4, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Well, he knows your thought afar off, and then he knows the, the, the word that's in your mouth. The thing that you're going to speak. He knows everything. It says there, Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. In other words, uh, God has the ability to surround you. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Uh, David said that kind of knowledge, uh, it goes above my ability to, to think about how great this God is. Um, and, and he keeps on going on this thing. He says, whether shall I go from the Spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? You can't get away from the presence of God. If he knows everything about you... If he knows where you've been, where you're going, when you get up, when you sit down, when you rise from bed, when you go to bed, the thoughts are far off, the word that's in your mouth, if he can beset you around about, and if he can uh, 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 get to you no matter where you are, there's a God that you can't get away from. There's a lot of people that try to remove God from their life completely. By saying that there is no God. The Bible says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. That's a fool. 
And a man gets up and, and they, they pretty it up in fancy terms and say, well, I'm an atheist. He's a fool. That's what the Bible says. He's a fool. No such thing as an atheist. God knows all about that man and does certain things to cause that man to realize what kind of God he is. Now, if God is this kind of God, then there's, there's uh, something that we should do. One of the things that we should do is we ought to have a fear of God. We ought to fear God. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, reverence for God or respect for God. I'm talking about being afraid of God. You know, you can love someone and be afraid of them. You can love God and fear God. You ought to fear God. If God is that great and that mighty and that powerful, you know what he's going to do someday? He is going to hold you accountable. He's going to hold you accountable for him putting you on this earth and your actions and everything you've done while you've been here on this earth. That's a fearful thing to think about. You ought to fear a God like that. You ought to fear God because he's keeping a record. He says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36, Every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Man's going to give account. And uh, we, we want to get away from accountability. We want to act like, well, you know, we'll die. God will forget about it. God, won't, God doesn't keep that accurate of a record. Oh, man, he's going to be able to tell you every time you sat down. He knows about it. And he's going to call you into judgment. You say, well, I think I'm going to get around that judgment. Well, maybe. Let's see. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the Bible says this. Let's just turn to Ecclesiastes for a minute. And uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, this sums it all up. After uh, Solomon gets done, the wisest man in the world, uh, a man that God gave wisdom to, when he gets all done with uh, looking at things as they are under the sun, and he said this, here's the kind of man Solomon was. He said, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. I'm reading in chapter 2, I told you to go to chapter 12, but I'm reading in chapter 2. He says, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this is also vanity, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. Of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men, which they should do under heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works. I builded me houses. He is a builder. He says, I planted me vineyards. He was a gardener. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees. In them of all kinds of fruit, I made pools of water to water therewith the wood that brought forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and, and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar uh, treasures a uh, treasure of kings and of the province, I get me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And he gets going down through there and talks about all the things that he was able to do and accomplish that people are trying to do this very day. And when he gets, gets through with it all, you know what he says? It's all vanity. It's all in vain. It's just vain man trying to succeed and trying to accomplish and ever striving to do a little bit more and a little bit more so that he feels good about the things that he's accomplished in life. And he says, when you get to the end of all that, when you get done laughing... When you get done with the musicians and the singers and the uh, people playing music, when you get done the building, when you get done the planning, when you get done uh, and you can look over everything that you have done in your life to make you feel like you've accomplished something, he says, you know what it is? It's vanity. That's what it is. It's all vanity. And then he gets down to the very end 
of the thing and says in chapter 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of men. Fear God. I know that's Old Testament, but you know something? That God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament, and I'm still to fear God, even though we live in the age of grace, I'm still to fear God. Fear of God, something important. Then he says this, 14, why should I fear God? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, if God's going to bring everything into judgment, whether it be good or evil, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And you say, well, I'm saved. I'm not going to stand before that great judgment day when God is going to judge the, uh, the, the, the dead, the small, and the great. And I'm not going to be there at that judgment. No, but you're going to be here at this judgment. Judgment in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And he says there in verse 6, Therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's to the Christian. That's to you that are saved here this morning. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And that's what it says. Good or bad. You say, well, I won't have to give account of my sins. Because they're all covered in, under the blood of Jesus Christ. Absolutely right. But you'll have to give account of the things that you've done in your body, whether they be good or bad, after you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's your works. Good or bad. You'll have some good works. You'll have some bad works. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says there's six, six things you can build on the foundation. Gold, silver, precious stone, good works, or wood, hay, stubble, bad works. So you're working every day. And you're doing good works or you're doing bad works. And you ought to fear God because you're going to be held accountable someday for your works as a child of God, as a Christian. I'm not preaching heresy here. I'm reading it to you right from the Bible. I'm rightly dividing the word of truth right now. And it's either going to be good or bad. It's either going to be a bonfire or rewards. You'll be there. You'll be saved. Yet so is by fire. That's what it says. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But you're not going to get any rewards if your works have been bad. Now, I'm thankful that my sins are under the blood. And I know in the 44 years that I've been saved, that some of my works have been good and some of my works have been bad. And the fire of God is going to sort that stuff out. And the bad stuff is going to burn up. And the good stuff is what is going to be rewarded. Fear God. You ought to fear God. As Solomon said, the wisest man, he says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So you ought to fear God. Not only that, you ought to fear God, not only because he's going to hold you accountable, but you ought to fear God because it's, it's, it's the thing that God says you should do. Man should fear God because he is also a God of wrath. And uh, let's get back over there to uh, Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And David says this, how am I going to get away from God? 
Where am I going to flee from God? He says uh, down there in verse 12, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Uh, let me go back up to verse 8. Verse 8 or verse 7. Whither shall I flee from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up it, uh, into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, a man ought to fear God, because not only because he's going to be held accountable... And not only because God is keeping a record, but he ought to fear God because he can't get away from the presence of God. No matter where you go, God's going to be there. And a a, a person can't uh, run from God, hide from God. If man goes to heaven, God's there. He said, if man goes to hell, he said, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, there's a sense in which God isn't going to be in a, in a, a hell where a person is going to uh, burn because he's a sinner that never came to Jesus Christ, there's going to be a sense in which God's not there. But you know, the presence of God will be there in the thoughts of that man. I mean, when the rich man went to hell, you know what his thoughts were about? His thoughts were not about what he had on this earth. Although Abraham son, said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil. Now thou art tor- uh, he, now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. But you know, you know what the man couldn't get away from? He couldn't get away from the thought that... He wished someone could come over to where he was to help him, to cool his tongue. He wished someone would go to his five brethren that were going to come to this place. In hell, there is a remembrance of God. So a person doesn't get away from God. I believe in hell, a man that is lost will remember the opportunities that God gave him to be saved. I believe in hell, a man will have the remembrance of the way God dealt with him and the good things that God did for him to, that he might turn to the Lord and repent of his sins. Take your Bible and go to Romans chapter 2. And I have to wrap this up. But Romans chapter 2. And... Uh, It says in verse, um, in verse 5, But after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Um, I'm looking for that verse, and I don't have it marked in this Bible, but I'm looking for that verse that says the goodness of God... Verse 4, okay. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness or, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Now, if God does good things to get a man saved, if God does good things to that lost man to get him to repent and turn to God, don't you think that in hell, when that man has a remembrance of things that happened back here on this earth, that he's not going to remember the good things that God did for him to try to get him to repent of his sin? I think he will. Just like that rich man in hell remembered his five brethren. And he knew the way they were living and what they were doing and that they were going to come to that same place. So... David in Psalm 139 tells you some things about God. It'd be good to just study Psalm 139 for about a week. Go through each one of those verses. Think about those verses. Think about how, how great God is and how he's able to know everything about every individual on the face of this earth. And no man's going to get away from that God. 
A lost man will stand before that God and give account of his works. A saved man will stand before Jesus Christ and give account of his works. Two different judgments there. One man ends up going into the lake of fire because he refused God's plan of salvation. The other man will wind up in heaven without rewards because he didn't do anything for the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here on this earth. So if you're saved this morning, uh, my message to you would be do something for Jesus Christ. Live for him. Do some good works that when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, there may be some things that don't burn. And my message to you, if you're lost in here this morning, is God knows everything that's going through your mind, your heart, your mouth, and everything about you, and you need to turn to him as quick as you can and repent of your sins and trust his son, Jesus Christ, lest you wind up in the devil's hell forever. Our Father, I pray that you'd bless the Sunday school lesson, and Father, I ask that you'd use it for your honor and glory. And Lord, uh, if there's one person in this building that has never been saved, and Lord, uh, I don't know the hearts of men and women, but you do. I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them, that they would turn to you and trust you as their Savior. Now, Lord, help us as Christians to live for you, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.